Let's open our Bibles tonight to Revelation. Sorry about the delay. One extra song. Revelation chapter 6. Before we read together in Revelation, let's bow in prayer and commit this time to the Lord. Father, we thank You for this time that we have to assemble to look into Your Holy Word. We thank You for the revelation that You gave to Your Son, Christ, and He, through an angel, passed it on to John. And Father, we are so encouraged by the revelation that You gave to John and for his recording it. Father, we know that ultimately we are going to be separated from sin, the sin-cursed earth, and separated unto perfect righteousness in your presence. And Father, we sure do look forward to that day. And so it is with great joy in our hearts that we read the Revelation and understand future things. May our hearts be encouraged. May we be lifted up and edified, Father, to live with more hope in our hearts and have that eternal, blessed hope perspective that you desire as we eagerly wait for our great God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. May uh, you work mightily tonight through the power of your Spirit and your living Word, the truth that may it become implanted in our hearts, Father, that we may be able to live it out each and every day. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. <clears throat> well, we are presently in chapter 6. And last week, we looked at the first seal. You recall, chapters 4 and 5 were a picture of the throne room. And praise to the Lamb. And then in chapter 5, He took the scroll with the seven seals. He took the scroll from His Father. And more praise erupted at that time. And then in the beginning of chapter 6, he begins to break the seals on the scroll. And uh, just in review, um, this uh, this chapter, set 6, begins the climax of the age-long conflict between God and Satan. Chapter 6 is the beginning of the seven-year period of of God's judgment to test those who dwell on the earth. This is yet future. This will be a period of judgment increasing in intensity. It will as well be a great period of evangelism. And I might add, which I probably should have put in this little summary, that the church will be resurrected before this period of time begins. Uh, that phrase, to those who dwell on earth in the middle paragraph, we saw at least, I think, seven places where it, it always refers to unbelievers. And so God's judgment is coming on the earth to test those unbelievers and try God's will is to turn the heat up, as it were, in the pot to cause them to be so uncomfortable that they either shake their fist violently at God or they accept Jesus Christ as their Savior. And so, unfortunately, uh, as human beings, we know our own nature, don't we? Sometimes we don't make any changes until we feel what? Pain. When we feel pain, then we say, okay, I've got to make some changes here. Until then, we sail along. And uh, and that and this is what I believe God is doing in the period of tribulation. He's bringing His wrath upon the earth, but it's also going to be a period of great 
evangelism. The four seals that we are going to see in the beginning here in verses 2 through 8, uh, which uh, we, we will get through uh, tonight, I believe, easily and go on to maybe the fifth. The first four seals are going to reveal the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Each rider has limited power over the earth. They are not individual personalities, but rather personify world conditions, as we will see. These are all review. This is a famous painting um, painted in 1887 by Victor Vaznetsov and... It pictures the uh, in the the first horse, the white horse. It pictures conquest, then war, and then famine, and then death follows at the end. That's just to give you an idea of the synopsis of it. I believe the first writer. This is where we concluded last week. I believe the first writer represents all of the antichrists appearing in the beginning of the tribulation. Matthew 24, 5 says, Many will come in my name. This is Jesus speaking. Many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. We have to remember, and this revelation is all about this, but we have to remember even today, we are in a spiritual battle. And we, the work of Satan is is strong, the work of Satan is cunning, deceitful, and it says in 1 Peter 5, 8 that Satan prowls around. He prowls about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. So he's always on the prowl, and he's always looking for someone to devour. And I like to bring up what I believe the people that Satan can devour, the believers that Satan can devour are believers who are not walking with the Lord. Believers who are stiff-arming God in some way or some area of their life. And God and Satan sees what's going on in your life. And he says, I can jump into this one and I can devour this person. And so, it takes rebellion or resistance in your heart to the will of God and Satan can go to work. Remember, we're in a spiritual battle and this is really what all of the revelation really boils down to. One huge spiritual battle. All right. I think that... Oh, we looked these verses up last week. These men uh, that the first writer represents uh, these men are false Christ who are seeking to draw people away from the true uh, Christ. All right. Now, <clears throat> we're going to read in verses, well, I was going to say three and four. Let's read one through four to begin with. Now I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures sing with a voice like thunder, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a white horse. He who sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him. And he went out, conquering and to conquer. When he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature saying, Come and see. Another horse, fiery red, went out, and it was granted to the one who sat on it to take peace from the earth, and that people should kill one another, and there was given to him a great sword. So this is the second seal, and it represents war. Christ opens the second seal, and there the second living creature... And the second living creature, according to Revelation 4, 7, says the second living creature was like a calf. And he says, come and see. This horseman riding in a fiery, on a fiery red horse and wielding a great sword that was given to him was granted the authority to take peace from the earth 
and that people should be uh, should kill one another. This taking this is taking place during the beginnings of birth pangs. This is the very very first part of the tribulation when these first seals are broken. In Matthew 24, 6 through 8, if you recall, we looked at that last week. It says, you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. Nations will rise up against nations. These are the beginnings of birth pangs. And those of you who have had a baby, you ladies, you know the beginning of birth pangs, and then they intensify until the baby is born. Well, the same idea here is this is the beginning, the first, second, third seal. It's the beginning of birth pangs, uh, as we read in Matthew 24. And it's in going to increase in intensity as we go through the tribulation until uh, the end of the tribulation and God finally comes in and what's that? oh go ahead well as it says here in verse 4 uh the uh, the second the second uh rider on the fiery red horse was granted the ability to take peace from the earth and i believe this means the entire earth i think there'll be this indicates widespread war now, even though the Antichrist in the beginning will make a covenant with Israel, it doesn't mean that they, there won't be war, widespread war around the earth. I'm not saying everywhere. I'm just saying there'll be wars and rumors of wars and, yeah, it'll be, it'll be the beginnings of unsettledness on the whole earth. That's the idea, I think. All right, now, <clears throat> um, verse 4, uh, when we see the word another, I want to point this out. This is further um, proof that um, the rider in the first horse is not the Messiah. The word another, another horse, this is alas. There are two words for another, alas and heteros. Alas means another of the same kind. In this case, another horse of the same kind as the first horse. Uh, and this, I think we take the four riders collectively together like they've been portrayed, that they're all, they're all evil, they're all bad, and so this would, Christ the Messiah wouldn't fit in as the first writer. It just doesn't make contextual sense that he would be uh, mixed in with the three following writers of the apocalypse. All right. Uh, peace is taken away from the earth at this time with the second seal broken. Uh, so, and, of course, that's what happens. What, what was the first rider? He's going out to conquer. So when, when a rider, when, when there's a nation or nations that are going out to conquer other nations and take other people's land and properties, there's going to uh, be war. Uh, peace is going to be taken uh, from the earth. And, again, uh, this is a worldwide happening. So who is the second horseman? Robert Thomas says that he is a representative of the forces of war and bloodshed with their consequent, with their, uh, consequent horrors. So he's a representative of war and bloodshed. And the fiery red speaks of bloodshed. The fiery red horse speaks of bloodshed. And the sword speaks of war and and violent death. Though we, now we're done with the second seal, and I want to make a comment here. Though we go through this briefly, 
Let's understand this was not an insignificant event. Peace is taken from the world. Widespread war, as I said. Uh, you know, you think of when we when we got into war. I, I remember when um, a Desert Storm, how well that was covered, and our, our whole nation was glued to the TV. We were going to war. And we were engaging in war. It was, it was, uh, prayerful for our soldiers and all, all the military that were going in, but it was, um, just kind of unsettling in, in one sense. And so you, you can imagine if it's virtually, uh, war is breaking out, war and rumors of war, nation rising against nation all around, people are gonna say, What's going on? This is getting crazy. And so to us, we just boom, boom, boom. We just went through it quickly. But really try to put yourself in the situation like that. It's going to be a, it's going to be a big deal. So, third seal. Famine. Let's read in verses 5 and 6. When he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come and see. So I looked, and behold, a black horse, and he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A quart of, a quart of wheat for a denarius, and a three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not harm the oil and the wine. So, Christ opens the third seal. The third living creature says, Come and see. third living creature had a face like a man. John saw a rider on a black horse who had a pair of scales in his hand. And this horseman is a personification of famine. Then John hears, a voice in the midst of the four living creatures. Interesting. Uh, and he, he says, A quart of wheat for a denarius and three quarts of barley for a denarius. And do not harm the oil and the wine. Now the four living creatures, as we recall, the four living creatures surround the throne. So if this is coming from the midst of the four living creatures, we can assume this is coming from the throne, this statement. It's either the Lamb is making this statement or the Father is making uh, this statement. A day's wage was a silver coin called a denarius, a Roman coin, worth about 15 cents. It would take a day's wage to buy either a quart of wheat or three quarts of barley. This expresses, if you had to give an entire day's wage to buy enough food for one person to live on, that would be very expensive. So we have to look at it, uh, not that it, oh, 15 cents, that's nothing. No, that was a day's wage. So all your money would be given just to survive, just to eat. And everyone would have to be making that much money, otherwise there wouldn't be enough food to go around. This expresses a severe food shortage, a famine, which is going to be caused by war, as we just saw. And that's what war will do. Many people will starve to death during the tribulation. The scales that the rider was holding indicate a shortage of food in that it has to be weighed. Now there's a parallel record in Ezekiel of a famine, the same event, uh, not the same event, but famine in the southern kingdom. Let's go to Ezekiel 4.16. Just a few, no, I'm thinking of Amos, 
I turn to Amos. Just a few books back from Amos. You know where that is now. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel. Ezekiel 4. And verses 16 and 17. Oops. <clears throat> Moreover, he said to me, Son of man, surely I will cut off the supply of bread in Jerusalem. They shall eat bread by weight and with anxiety, and shall drink water by measure and with dread, that they may lack bread and water and be dismayed with one another and waste away because of their iniquity. God uses famine as a disciplinary tactic or measure, disciplinary measure. And here we see this is what is going to happen. This is part of putting the pressure on. This is part of God's wrath being poured out. <clears throat> And as I said, a quart of wheat was only enough to, to sustain one person for one day. Barley was less expensive, but also less desirable. So what does Jeremiah, what does the prophet Jeremiah say about starving to death? You might be surprised. I, I should have helped. Had you stay there. Lamentations. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations. Chapter 4. <clears throat> uh, Lamentations uh, 4, 8, and 9. Now their appearance is blacker than soot. They go unrecognized in the streets. Their skin clings to their bones. It has become as dry as wood. Those slain by the sword are better off than those who die of hunger. For these pine away, stricken for lack of the fruits of the field. So Prophet Jeremiah says, those who died by the sword are better off than those who starved to death. Uh, famine is a, is a horrible thing. And of course, we, we really, in this country, we don't have a clue of what that's like. Yes, we can read and we can see pictures of countries where they are, some people are starving to death. But we really don't know. We have the other problem. We have too much to eat. And that does become a problem for us. Alright, verse, now back to Revelation. <clears throat> At the end of verse 6, it says, And do not harm the oil and the wine. What is that all about? Well, this phrase indicates that oil and wine will not be as scarce as the grains. The oil was used for cooking, for lamps, and anointing. It appears that God would not allow the oil and wine crop to be harmed by the horsemen. Therefore, we can conclude that the famine only, will only be partial at this time. As well, oil and wine were not necessities for life, like wheat and barley, and therefore could be interpreted as an inequity between the poor and the rich. The poor barely are able to buy enough bread to survive, and in some cases, not able to buy enough to survive, 
while the rich were able to buy wheat, oil, and wine. Throughout time, God has used famine as a means of judgment. And we're not going to turn Leviticus 26. You recall that Leviticus 26 talks about the five cycles of discipline that came upon Israel. First, he starts low-grade, low-grade punishment, low-grade pain. And then if they don't repent, then he has to step it up and step it up till the fifth cycle is they are dispersed, they are taken captive to a foreign country. One of the cycles is famine in Leviticus 26. Let me read to you, though, Deuteronomy 11, 16 through 17. Moses is speaking to the people as they are getting ready to go into the promised land, to conquer the promised land. And he says, Take heed to yourselves, lest your heart be deceived, and you turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. Lest the Lord's anger be aroused against you, and He shut up the heavens so that there will be no rain, and the land yield no produce, and you perish quickly from the good land which the Lord is giving you. So, famine is yet another of the beginning of the birth pangs that they will uh, be uh, going through. As God's judgment intensifies, the rich won't escape His judgment. Alright, now the fourth seal. Why widespread death. Let's read verses 7 through 8. <clears throat> when he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature saying, Come and see. So I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and the name of him who sat on it was Death, and Hades followed with him. And power was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword, with hunger, with death, and by the beast of the earth. So as Christ opens the fourth seal, the the fourth living creature, uh, like a flying eagle, says, Come and see! There was a horseman named Death. Now, there's a definite article there. The horseman's name was The Death. The Death. And Hades followed after the horseman. He followed the rider. Now, Death and Hades are used often together. I'll just turn back to Revelation 1.8. <clears throat> Well, let's see. They get that wrong. 118. Excuse me. 118. I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. I have the keys of Hades and of death. So authority is given to this writer of the fourth seal. Uh, to kill with the sword, to kill with hunger, and by the beast over one-fourth of the earth. Uh, I want to take a little rabbit trail, because some of you might be wondering about Hades and what what Hades is. And so I'll I'll start with a slide that actually uh, Jim Cahoon designed this slide. He gave it to me, sketched out. And uh, you remember that, Jim? <laughs> and all I want to point out here is uh, the I just want to point out um, in the Hebrew, it's called Sheol. In the Greek, it's called Hades. 
as we see it here in the book of Revelation. And we'll look at some verses on it. I want to run, I want to run through this so you have a little bit of understanding of, of Hades. <clears throat> and back in, before Christ's ascension, uh, there were uh, two compartments. There was paradise and there was hell, or a place of torment, it says. And when we look at Luke 16 in just a minute, you'll see that there was, as it says here, there was a great gulf fixed between these two compartments. But they could see each other, and they could actually hear each other. I don't know how that works, but um, this gives you a little bit uh, of an idea, but we'll we'll get more on this as we go through these slides. Hades, and this is taken from uh, the theological dictionary of the New Testament done by Kittle and Bromley. Uh, I did reword and I I, I uh, condensed um, his points, their points. And uh, in some t in some places reworded it myself. Hades is the realm of the dead. This term came to denote the place of temporary sojourn prior to resurrection. Let's go to Isaiah twenty six nineteen. Your dead shall live together with my dead body. They shall arise. Awake and sing, you who dwell in the dust. For your dew is like the dew of herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. All, all dead will rise from the dead. Not at the same periods of time. Of the... Old Testament saints will rise at the second advent of Jesus Christ along with the tribulational saints. We will rise, the dead in Christ, the church, will rise before the tribulation. And then the all unbelievers of all time will rise from the dead in Revelation 20, to go to the great white throne. We'll read a verse on that in a minute. All right. The righteous were separated from the unrighteous in Hades. So let's turn to Luke 16. This is the story of the rich man and Lazarus. Lazarus being the poor beggar, not the Lazarus who rose from the dead, Jesus' good friend. Luke sixteen twenty three. <clears throat> let's see, um, let's go to verse, back up to verse 22. So it was that the beggar, Lazarus, died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And being in torments in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off, and he saw Lazarus in his bosom. Then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I, am in for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received good things, and likewise Lazarus, Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted and you are tormented. And besides all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, 
so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. The real key, the real key of why the rich man was in the place of torment was because they didn't believe the prophets, all that the prophets had told in regards to God and placing faith in God for forgiveness of their sins. And that comes out as you read down, but I don't want to go through that because I want to make cover some ground here. Uh, turn to Matthew 12.40. One goes down into to Hades. So you say, is Hades in the middle of the earth or is it? I, I don't know. But um, <clears throat> some believe that it is under the earth. The waters above and the waters below. It's under the waters below. Um, but for me, I'm not too worried about that because I'm not going there, number one. And number two, I know that it exists. And I know there are people in torment there right now today. I don't need to exactly know where that is. I don't think the Bible really pinpoints it well enough. Let's read in Matthew 12, uh, 40. For as Jonah... Was Well, let me read 39. Uh, the Pharisees asked for a sign in verse 38. And uh, Jesus answered and said to them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign. And no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. That seems pretty convincing there, uh, that it's in the heart of the earth. And, I mean, that is probably the case. What else about Hades? Uh, the stay is limited. Now let's go to Revelation 20.13. They're not always going to be in Hades. It's a, it's a temporary holding place now, presently, today, <coughs> excuse me, today, for all unbelievers. <clears throat> Just want to say, I want to put, I want to put the great white throne in its, in its chronological time. Today, we are on earth. We, we are the church. We are God's hands and feet, as it were, to bring the good news of Jesus Christ to a lost and dying world so that hopeless and helpless people can have purpose and meaning in life. They can know that they can be forgiven of their sins. They can know that they can have peace with God through faith in Jesus Christ because He bore our sins and we can be forgiven. And so, we are uh, here on earth today at, uh, to that end. There will be a day, and it is imminent. It means it could happen tonight, tomorrow, next week, next month, next year, and you could just keep going on and on, that Jesus Christ is going to take His church. These are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. He's going to take us up to be in heaven with Him. At some point, very soon thereafter, the church is taken up from the earth. God's wrath is going to begin, Revelation chapter 6, to be poured out on this earth. Increasing intensity until the second advent of Jesus Christ. When Jesus Christ comes back to earth, riding on a white horse, uh, they, the armies of the earth, Revelation 20, I think, 19, at the end of chapter 19, the armies surround Christ and us, because we are the armies riding with Christ, 
And Christ will, uh, with the sword of his mouth, first he casts the false prophet and the Antichrist into the lake of fire. And then with the sword of his mouth, he speaks the word and the armies of all the world are slain. And then, let me get my chronology right, then Christ uh, establishes His kingdom. Now see, all that were in rejection and in uh, rebellion against Christ are all now perished. So Christ, only ones left on earth at this time are believers who lived through the tribulation. Then you have the resurrection of the Old Testament saints, the resurrection of the martyred saints of the tribulation, and they enter into and Christ establishes His kingdom on earth. And then for a thousand years he reigns. And for a thousand years, uh, an innumerable number of people are born. And the earth is well populated once again. And at the end of the thousand year reign of Christ, Satan is released. He's been bound for a thousand years. He is released from the bottomless pit. And he will go to the four corners of the earth. He will gather an army. An army, it says in Revelation, that is innumerable. You can't count how large this army is that's coming against Jesus Christ. And Satan is the uh, commander-in-chief of this army, as it were. <clears throat> and it says that fire comes down from heaven. They surround Jerusalem, the capital of the world where Jesus Christ reigns from as King of the earth. They surround Jerusalem. And it says that fire comes down from heaven and, and extinguishes all of them. They're all, they're all burned up. After that, then there is the resurrection of the dead. All dead of all time. Even the dead that just died at the end of the Millennial Kingdom, all dead unbelievers are raised and they're coming to the great white throne right here. I say all of that just to let you know where this fits in in time. Now, what happens after the great white throne? The heavens and the earth, present heavens and earth, are burned up. God creates new heavens and new earth. And then that is to be, we go to the new heavens and the new earth. We are um, living with Christ on the new heavens and the new earth, totally forever separated from unrighteousness, from sin, etc. And we are uh, separated to God uh, with Him forever in perfect righteousness. So, the great white throne. Let's read in verse... Let's see. Um, let's start in 11. Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God and the books were opened and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So there you see uh, death and Hades, as it were, is cast into the lake of fire. Uh, whoops. Oh, I messed up. Uh, Jesus was in Hades. Luke 23, 43. <clears throat> Luke 
The scene here is Jesus is on the cross and he has two thieves on his one on his right and one on his left. And one of the criminals in verse 39 blasphemed Christ. The other one in verse 40 I rebuked him, saying, Do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, Today... You will be with me in paradise. At that time, that's referring to the compartment of Hades, paradise. <clears throat> Let's look at Acts 2.27. This is a uh, prophetic psalm of David being quoted. And we'll see that it is referring not it was referring to him, but it was he was writing in reference to himself, but he was prophetically writing of Christ. Um, let's start in verse twenty six. Therefore, my heart rejoiced and my tongue was glad. Moreover, my flesh also will rest in hope, for you will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. For you have made known to me the ways of life, and you will make me full of joy in your presence. Look down at verse 31. Or the end of verse 30. According to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne. He, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God has raised up, of which we are all witnesses. So you see, Christ was was in Hades. And Ephesians 4, 8 and nine. <clears throat> I'll read verse seven of Ephesians four. But to each one of us grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore he says, When he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now this, he ascended, what does it mean, but that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth. And I believe he's referring to paradise there. And when he, when he came, when he ascended, I believe when it says he led captivity captive, and there is room for disagreement on this, and I don't hold to it dog, dogmatically, but I think this is the point of time when Christ ascended, he led captivity captive. When he left Hades, Abraham's bosom, paradise, he took all the saints with him uh, to the Father. All right, or, or they went up and he went back on the earth at that time when he was resurrected. All right? Uh, so... And you can do your homework on that. And if you disagree with me, I'd love to hear about it. Not really. I, I don't mean it that way. I mean, yeah, you know, if you have a different idea, I'm open. All right, number six in regards to Hades. And we've got to pick up the pace here. I only have two, three more, two more. After Christ's ascension, believers who die go to be with the Lord in heaven. Second Corinthians 5.8. Or they go under the altar of incense, Revelation seven nine. No, that should be that should be um, six nine. Yeah, that should be six nine. I apologize. Those are the martyred martyred saints of the tribulation. But the the point is this: 
after Christ ascended, no one, no believers who die go to paradise anymore. That's emptied out. And they go to be face to face with the Lord. We know the verses where Paul says, uh, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. I go into the Lord's presence. All right, next one. After Christ's ascension, only unbelievers go to Hades. And we just read Revelation 20, 13, and 14. And Christ has the power over death and Hades. And we read uh, that also in uh, Revelation 1, 18. Boy, I really messed up on those references. All right. <clears throat> So, Hades is that region. It says the horse that we just finished with, the fourth seal, widespread uh, death. This, is the horse rider is called the death and Hades follows behind him because as these people die, they are going to go into Hades. Uh, the death of the unbelievers. And so that's why Hades follows behind uh, the horse. All right, we'll stop there tonight. Um, I do uh, have a few other minor things to point out in that regard. We'll do that in our review uh, next week. And then we'll start with the fifth seal, the martyrs who are under the altar of incense. Let's pray. Father, we thank you uh, even though this is rather uh, grim. Uh, Father, it's going to be a horrible period of time on earth. Father, but we thank you for the revelation and for the entirety of your word, which reveals to us that we will not, according to Revelation 3.10, we will not go through the hour of trial or the hour of testing here on earth when you test those who dwell upon the earth. We will be uh, resurrected, taken up to be with you, Father, and we will uh, be joyfully, again, through the knowledge of the revelation, coming down with you at the end of the tribu period of tribulation to reign with you a thousand years. Encourage our hearts, Father, but also cause us to be sober-minded that we would not want any of our family, any of our friends, any of our neighbors, any of our co-workers to go through uh, what this period of time represents, Father, your wrath being poured out. I pray that we might, while we have breath and life, we might give the good news of Jesus Christ to those around us, Father, to tell them the hope that we have in Jesus, and they too can have the same hope and, Father, I pray that we would have a zeal about this and a real strong desire to share Christ with and your love with those around us. We thank you now for the time of fellowship and for the food that's been provided for us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.